Hey, this was a fun project. It's something I've been needing for a while, and there's really just one thing that I would change, and I'll show you what that is so that yours comes out even better. I decided to go with Baltic birch. It's strong and much more stable than solid wood. Now, as you can see here, I used the Shaper Origin to cut this out, but this could be cut out a number of ways with a router, by hand, at the bandsaw, a jigsaw, right? Okay, see this little jog right there and right there? So this was made in Shaper Labs, and I thought I had snapped this component to the circle, but looks like I missed a little bit. But no big shake for this project. Absolutely does not matter. I'm cutting the pieces free at the bandsaw, and the reason I didn't plunge all the way through with the Shaper Origin is because this steady rest is going to be comprised of several layers and so I'll stack them all up and then sand smooth the perimeter. As I'm watching this video I suppose I could have stacked all three layers and then flush cut everything but I didn't and uh, I really love this part here because magnets a thousand and one uses or I have those two tapped holes for uh, a knob. Options right? Of course here, a simple standard process of routing things flush. I love using a 23 gauge uh, nail gun to hold parts together like this. Of course you could use, you know, double stick tape or the, the blue tape with CA trick, lots of ways to do things. You may already know this trick, maybe you do, maybe you don't, I don't know. But if you're ever cutting a nail, rather than cutting it, wiggle it back and forth. It'll break off clean below the surface. All right, with the bin in place and the fence in place, I need to cut grooves in these three pieces. I cut an extra one as a test piece. He means slots, not grooves. <laughs> Let's see, this guy is two and three eighths. So this is gonna be five sixteenths, although that's been sharpened, so it's a little bit under. I'll probably have to make a couple of passes, right? No big shake, what we'll do is measure that two and three eighths, subtract five sixteenths, leaves us one sixteenth. And I know the Europeans are just <laughs> cringing right now. So two and a sixteenth, we divide that in half, it'd be one and a 32nd. So I can go one and a 32nd right in there. Let's mark. Let's check that. Looks to be pretty close. It's 516. So we're going to do a test run anyway. Anyway, one and a 32nd. So what I can do is take uh, something like three quarter. And then I need that difference. One, two, three, four sixteenths plus a thirty second. Four sixteenths is a quarter. Nine thirty seconds. Let me just put that there, make sure there's not any burrs on that. And a three quarter spacer. We can bring this up till this just makes contact. This dude is in fact unplugged right in there okay we can make a test cut that should be dead center yeah and of course here I have a sample piece I can just make a shallow cut just to check my dimensions and it's probably a good idea for me to come in from both sides. That ensures that that slot will be centered. This can be a dangerous cut feeding backwards like this, but it's already been cut and I'm just taking off the minimal amount. Then I can check that. Looks like we have a 5 16th slot, even though the bit has been sharpened and is a little undersized. So that should work well, yeah? I seldom, if ever, make a plunge cut all the way through my work. 
I make multiple passes. It takes a little bit longer, but it's much safer. The stop locks ensure a positive start to the plunge and, of course, accurate cuts. Now, there seems to be a common mm, consensus that plunge cuts at the router table are dangerous. And yeah, of course, they can be. What's important is to make sure you have a good grip and hold down the piece securely. It can tip sideways, so don't hold it from the edge. Right in the middle is where you want to hold it. At the end, of course, plunge, make your cut. These are some 5 16 machine screws, and I'll just check the fit. Yep, perfect. I quite often use 5 minute epoxy. In a situation like this, I like the rigidity that it adds, and of course, it sets up quickly. All right, this steady rest is starting to take shape, and at this point, I just need to lay out where the three adjustable arms will come in. So, a little bit of double stick tape will hold this piece down in the center. And then we can do a layout. Nothing tricky here, just finding the center, right? I've always loved the process of dividing the circumference of a circle into six exact equal spaces. Well, yeah, by using the length of the radius. Of course, I only need three of them, so I'll just lay out six and then use every other one. Then it's just a matter of cutting all these pieces to create the cleats, I suppose you could call them, for these adjustable wheel guides is uh, probably a good name, yeah? If you don't already practice marking like this, you should. It's an excellent way to quickly lay out something that's not super important and it trains the eye. Now, I don't always pre-drill. The pilot hole should be smaller than the screw threads, right? About the shank of the screw. Or, of course, I could have used a drill bit with a countersink built in. But there are a lot of ways to do things. And a lot of times for something like this, I'll just use wax. Yeah, man, that's, gonna, that's going to work well. And now I can drill some holes for the knob that will allow adjustment. Again, I'm just marking this close, nothing critical. And here's a great way to locate the left side of your blade with some arbitrary spacer that's against the fence. The left edge of that spacer lines up with the left side of the blade, ensuring that I'll know exactly where that cut is going to be made. So now that I have the guide blocks in place, whatever you want to call them, I can smooth the interior, right? And then move on and sand the exterior, the perimeter as well. And here I'm attaching the base. This will sit on top of the lathe bed and a lot of good contact surface, lots of glue and some screws. And I decided that a chunk of wood would add a bit of rigidity here. All right, so there are all the components. Of course, these dudes here go on here, and I'll I'll drill these for the for the wheel wheels. Once I get the wheels, they they haven't come in yet. And then I'll also I need to drill all the way through here. I have some knobs that will affix these in position. And then these two pieces will hold this onto the bed, the lathe bed, right? And I'll just have this knob going all the way through there. So now what I want to do is I've already centered this hole. I want to line these up in relation to that piece and dead center. So again, I'm always using a scribe. It's just quick, easy, and very accurate. So you can see these two lines. I can line that up. Those go there. I can do the same thing on this piece. So what I'll do is I'll just see what that dimension is. Five eighths plus. Of course, you don't have to be this accurate, but <laughs> accuracy, being accurate never hurts anything. So it's five eighths plus. I'm going to set my scribe on uh, five sixteenths. 
and then I can mark this guy, flip it. And when I line these marks up, I know that's gonna be dead on balls accurate. All right, with this dude constructed, I really should have drilled these holes first, but uh, I didn't, but no big deal. I got them. So 5 16th through hole, right? Uh, first, I did a counter bore, which is probably not even necessary, but I like the way those sit in there, these little T-nuts. So I did a counter bore, then the 5 16th through hole, and then I drilled partway through with a 3 8 to accommodate this shoulder, I guess. And then this part in here is round, so then I use a countersink on that. So that'll go in there, lock knob from the other side. I'm always set up, so I decided to throw on some shellacker. <laughs> All right, there it is assembled, and I ended up adding this dude in a groove just to keep that from swiveling. Not totally necessary, but it'll help. Well, all right, <laughs> there it is. Should work well, yeah? Let's go put it in place. So I changed this handle, kip handle, to uh, for a knob. I think it'll be, I think that kip handle will be cumbersome if I need to flip this thing 180 degrees. That is very solid. All right, this is fantastic. So once the steady rest is in place, I can slide the tailstock back on. I purchased this little metal lathe years ago. It's an Atlas lathe. It's small, but it, it works for what I need. And if I need a larger lathe, my dad has a South Bend 8-foot lathe, milling machine, and a full machine shop. So, yeah, I'm very, very blessed, very fortunate to have that access. So now with the live center in place, I can bring the wheels up till they just make contact. Okay, so it should be obvious that with the live center engaging in the workpiece, this will ensure that everything in fact stays centered. So the idea here is with a steady rest in place, I can back this off, put in a chuck, and drill this end. If you're not familiar with the Morse taper, it is a fabulous, genius method of adjoining two corresponding tapers. So essentially you have a cavity with a uh, taper and the corresponding shaft, also with a very slight taper, one, one and a half degrees or so, and they f fit so tightly that they can handle spinning, turning, incredible design. This would probably be the best bit for the cleanest hole. Problem is with these, they don't have a, much of a spur. They're designed to make a flat bottom hole. I think that would gauge okay. These, <laughs> despite uh, a lot of people thinking that they're cheap, inexpensive bits, well, they are inexpensive, but they actually cut really clean if they're maintained and sharpened correctly. Problem with this is it's a little bit long and truly not that accurate as far as being straight, um, I'm assuming. Yeah, it looks like it's a little off. So... I'll go with this dude. I've got a scale here so I can make contact there and then I'll know exactly how much I'm plunging. And it may be hard to see here, but to the right of the chuck, right where the shaft is emerging, you can see the beginning of the scale. I gotta tell you, I am loving this thing. I should have made it years ago. Now, 
I wouldn't use this for machine work, but if I'm turning wood, it'll be plenty accurate enough. Now what you can do to make yours even better is to order skateboard wheels. I ordered wheels for luggage and they don't have bearings, just bushings. So skateboard wheels will have bearings and they'll be much more accurate. And I actually meant to say inline skate wheels. Yeah. All right, we've got a drill bit in there and it's hard to see probably, but the contact point of the drill bit is just flush with this. And I put this scale on a quarter because if I need to back out, I don't want to go past the zero that'll release the Morse taper. So I can start at quarter inch and then I know that I need to go, let's see if I can get that in there. Camera's in the way. About two and a quarter. So two and a quarter plus a quarter. So I need to go minimum two and a half inches to drill this hole. This is working so well. And so once I have the counter bore and the through hole all the way through the knob, I can use the steady rest once again in conjunction with the life center, get everything centered, move the tailstock out of the way. And now I can begin to sand, uh, polish and finish. This thing turned out fantastic and I am super pleased with this little project. Well, what do you think of that? Looks good, huh? The wet look. Yeah, man. It's going to work. I'll uh, cut that loose and we're done. Fabulous. And there you have it. You know, this entire project started when I wanted to turn these knobs for my front wheel vise. Hopefully you got something out of this video. Do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And as always, thanks a ton for watching.